good afternoon and for anyone who's watching this later hello um my name is mark bradley but i'm talking about testing extensive reading i actually added this presentation topic um in order to test the software that we're using for this conference um but in fact um, I am interested, I'm very interested in the, the topic of testing extensive reading, and I'm just going to spend a few minutes talking about it. First, I'd like to um, look at these questions. What is, what is ER? What is extensive reading? Um, what are we assessing? And um, how do we do that? And maybe perhaps more fundamentally, why, why should we assess um, extensive reading. Um, there are a couple of reasons. There are three reasons I can think of. Um, one of them is that most of our institutions expect us to assess our students. So it's kind of, it's our job. Um, our, they, my university gives me students and I give them grades in return. Um, the students also expect us to give them a grade. And um, some of my students, I'm fairly sure, won't get out of bed. <laughs> if a grade is not attached to their work. Um, so there are reasons for assessing extensive reading. Um, and a couple of things about assessing reading though. Um, the first thing is that it's, it's almost impossible to actually assess reading. Um, we can't really test whether the words are going into their brains and what's happening in their brains to process the language. Um, another thing about assessing reading is it's probably detrimental. If we're assessing reading, we're often using time that could have been spent reading. So the act of assessing reading often means that the students will read less. Um, and often also reading should be an enjoyable, satisfying experience. Um, assessment often is not enjoyable and is not satisfying. And these are reasons, these are issues with, fundamental issues with reading. This is probably what led Richard Day to say um, in his 10, um, I call them the 10 commandments of extension. They're not commandments, they're 10, 10 guidelines for extensive reading. Um, he said that reading is its own reward, uh, not a test. Um, and this is usually interpreted as, as saying that assessment is not compatible with extensive reading. Um, other people have said similar things writing about assessing reading. Um, that in, in there's a short quote there, which testing destroys the very nature of the event. So by testing reading, we are destroying the pleasure and enjoyment of reading. Um, other, so if we're looking, looking from an assessment point of view then, um, assessment theory has, has different principles. Um, one of them is construct validity. Another one is reliability. Then there's backwash, also known as washback. Um, there are also formative and summative assessments. Um, I'm just going to look through these theories and how they relate to extensive reading. So first of all, what is, um, what is the construct? What exactly is extensive reading? What are we assessing? And um, we can look in the um, we can look in the assessment um, literature. For example, H. D. Brown wrote writing about assessment. He describes extensive reading as reading for global understanding, which I think we would all agree with. Um, focus on content, not form, which again I think most ER advocates and practitioners would agree with and uh, more than one page. Um, this is where I think a lot of people who practice extensive reading um, would consider extensive reading to be a lot more than one page. Um, and this is where we have a, a different view of extensive reading. Um, I think he's looking at extensive reading as a, as a text type for tests. So something that you can put in a test, whereas we're usually looking at extensive reading as more of a teaching methodology. It's something that our students do. Um, so there's this kind of um, gap between the assessment world and the um, reading world, the extensive reading 
world of practice. Um, Mark Helgerson has described extensive reading as students reading a lot of easy, enjoyable books. Um, so how do we, if, if this is what we mean by extensive reading, how do, we, how do we assess this? We're assessing a lot. We're assessing whether the books are easy. We're assessing whether the students are enjoying themselves. Um, Waring and McLean have looked at um, the core attribute of ER. Um, they consider extensive reading to be fast, fluent, comprehension of text for meaning, sustained over extended periods with minimal distractions. Um, this is looking at ER as a cognitive process. Um, so again, how do we, if this is our definition of extensive reading, how do we then test, how do we assess extensive reading? Um, so looking at the aims then, what, what are we trying to achieve by extensive reading? And we can look at the aims as um, coming from, as language teachers, um, we're trying to improve the language proficiency of our students or of ourselves. Uh, we're looking at fluency. We're maybe looking at general proficiency. We may be looking at one of the aims of ER to change attitudes towards language study. So some of us come from cultures where language study is based on grammar and translation. And maybe we want to move our students away from that view of language into something where language is is a real thing that they can enjoy. Um, and maybe we just want our students to read lots of stories. Uh, these are all, again, these are all the aims of what we're trying to do. And if we're assessing, then we need to assess where we're trying to get to. Um, at which point I'm gonna go back to physics and look at what Galileo said, measure what is measurable and make measurable what is not measurable. So when we're looking at assessment, what we're trying to do is, is basically turn things into numbers and turn things into measurement. Um, and this can be a good thing. It can be a bad thing. Um, and let's see what we can make measure, measurable. Um, so if we break down what we can assess, um, it's usually broken down into four different things, into knowledge and skills and practices and attitudes. And a lot of testing is testing knowledge, finding out, do our students know this piece of information? It's like we have a piece of information hidden under a cup and they need to tell us what's under the cup. And that's the way a lot of assessment works in a lot of education. Um, skills are also um, often used for assessment. For example, if you are having to have a driving test, um, you probably don't just want to know whether they have knowledge of driving. You want to see whether they can sit behind the wheel of a car and drive. So we always want to, we often want to test skills as well. But of course, this takes more time. Uh, testing knowledge is, is quicker and maybe easier. Um, can we test practices? It's possible to test practices to assess what people are actually doing. Um, and attitudes becomes more difficult. So in the case of extensive reading, then we could be testing knowledge of books. We could test knowledge of libraries. We could test knowledge of the rationale, the reason for doing extensive reading. We could test whether our students know about the methodology, whether they know what they should be doing as they read. <laughs> Um, for example, uh, for example, it, we may, um, we can, of course, do many tests, test whether students know what's in a particular book. Um, we could also try to test whether they know what books are in the library. Um, for example, here are some books. Which of these books are easier? Which of these books are more difficult?
Um, sorry, just a moment. Um, Donala, he's what? He's what? He's what? He's what? He's what? Sorry, could the could the host? Please mute your mic. Everybody, please. Because there's time, right? It's Beijing time. Then you press it after that, maybe there's a live stream. Then you start to talk about other things, or you can ask questions. Could the host please? Everybody, please. 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 Everybody, uh, so sorry. So for example, um, you could put these books in order of difficulty. This would test whether our students know have knowledge of the library. Um, these are the uh, Day and Bamford's um, ten principles of extensive reading, and many of us tell our students these principles. Uh, we can, of course, test whether the students know these principles. So this is a kind of conventional test where we're testing the rationale uh, behind extensive reading. Um, and there are many different reasons. There are many rationales behind extensive reading. For example, um, Stephen Krashen's input hypothesis. We could tell our students about this and then test them whether they've understood it. We could talk about vocabulary um, and collocation, the work of um, Paul Nation and Rob Waring. We could tell them about narratives and the way the story brain. We could talk about fluency. Uh, there are many ways that we can explain extensive reading and give reasons behind extensive reading to our students and many of these we can make tests and conventional quizzes for um, we can talk about reading styles we can talk about intensive and extensive reading uh, we can talk about different reading speeds we can talk about scanning and skimming um, we could, so um, this is the kind of questions we can ask our students. Um, what should you do if you don't like a book because it's too difficult or not interesting? Um, the, the correct answer, at least in my class, is stop reading and get a different book. Um, if they have listened to my explanation, they should get this answer. Um, how did you become proficient in your native language? Um, Again, probably um, by acquisition is of these questions and given the context of my class, that's the correct answer. Um, how often do you use a dictionary? Again, in my class, if they've listened to my in introduction, the correct answer is never. Um, and why are you reading? Um, this 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 question this is a slightly different question um and this the answer to this would tell us something rather different if they're reading because the teacher told them to that we may not be so happy about that if they're reading to improve their english that's probably better than just reading because the teacher told them to um if they're reading because it's more interesting than other kinds of study then that's maybe that's maybe good uh, if they're reading a story because they want to know what happens next, uh, that's even better. If we ask a student why they're reading and they just turn around and go, shh, that's perhaps what we want. Um, but again, we're, we're looking now more at attitude than knowledge. Um, we're looking at attitude towards particular books, attitude towards reading, attitude towards English language and culture. Um, attitude towards language study in general. These are things that we may hope to change. Um, can we assess attitude? Yes. Um, can we give grades on attitude? Um, if we're careful, um, perhaps we can. Uh, if we're getting our students to write comments, um, how do we judge their comments? Um, I've, as a teacher, I've struggled with assessing comments from students and I've struggled with assessing attitude. Um, what I usually do now is if they've written more, they get more points. Um, or sometimes if they answer a question, they get full marks. Whatever they say, um, the fact they've answered it, they get full marks. But this is, this is a difficult question 
Um, and when we're looking at goals, if we're assessing knowledge, so if I ask my students, um, how many times did you use a dictionary? If they say, oh, I never used a dictionary. Now, I don't know whether they are answering honestly that they didn't use a dictionary or they listen to me tell them don't use a dictionary and they're telling me what they think I want them to say. Um, and I'm not sure if so. Are we assessing their knowledge of the correct attitude or are we assessing their actual attitude? And um, is that how important is that? Um, so. Next, then. So another very important factor in assessment is a thing called backwash, also known as washback. Um, I studied engineering when I was at college. And in engineering, we have what's called destructive and non-destructive testing. So if you want to see how strong a bridge is, uh, you can do tests on the bridge to measure its strength, or you can put heavier and heavier loads on it until the bridge breaks. Um, of course, when the bridge is broken, you can no longer use it. And that's called destructive testing. Um, I sometimes feel that some of our language testing is destructive testing, that the tests themselves are destroying our students' language, if not their ability, um, their maybe destroying their motivation towards language. Um, and this is, if I can quote Bob the Builder, you need the right tool for the job. So a hammer, you can remove a bolt with a hammer, but the bolt won't work again. So the right tool is very important for the right job. And the same, all these things are assessment tools, and we need to choose the tools very carefully. Uh, to think about what we're doing. And we need to think very carefully about backwash. And backwash is the effect that assessment has on the learning process. Um, and this is an example of, of backwash. So I told, um, you can maybe see what happened here. This is one semester of students. Um, on the left is the number of pages they read. Along the bottom is the number of books they read. And you can see that a few students read um, six, seven, or eight books. Many students read 10 books. Nobody read nine books. And um, the, you can maybe guess the goal of the class was to read 10 books. That was their target for the semester. So many people read 10 books. Um, that's, that's kind of backwash. So the effect of the assessment, if your assessment says read 10 books, the students will read 10 books. Um, and maybe that's good for the students who were only going to read five books. But maybe some of these students would have read more books if we hadn't had that target. Um, and if you do set a target, then students will often just try to hit the target. Or sometimes they'll try to appear to hit the target. So they may not actually hit the target, but they'll try and find a way to make you think they have read 10 books. Um, we had feedback while we were doing this in a course that um, some of the students are just doing the minimum just to fulfill the requirement. Other teachers said setting a goal is meaningless because many students seem to be dishonest. Uh, we'll hear more about dishonesty later from, um, from Paul Goldberg and uh, Tom Rawson. Um, so this is another, this is the second semester then. And we can kind of see um, the second semester, the target was 14 books. So we have another kind of spike at 40. And there's still like a residual spike at 10 books for the students who thought that 10 books was the target for this semester as well. Um, so we need to think very carefully about um, what we want our students to do. And extensive reading, um, extensive means a lot. And most of the definitions of extensive reading are talking about reading a lot or reading for a long time. And if we do want our students to read a lot, then we should, I think, be trying to give them credit or give them assessment for how much they read. Um, this means they will be encouraged to read more or try and read more. Um, this comes to the question of how much is a lot. 
And um, we may have this conversation with our students. Um, how much do we have to read? Well, how much have you read? Oh, uh, two books. That's not enough. Um, so how much do they have to read? And how do we count what they read? We can count books, how many books they read. We can count pages. Uh, we can count words. Um, counting books uh, gives the students an incentive to read short and easy books. Uh, whereas counting words may give them an incentive to read longer, more difficult books. Um, generally, especially at the beginning, we want our students to read easy books. So perhaps at the beginning of your program, you want to give grades or credit for reading how many books. Uh, at the end, as they start to be getting to a higher level, uh, maybe we want an incentive on words. I usually give a combination of books and words so that if they're at a lower level, they can read more books to get credit. And if they're at a higher level, they'll read more words because they're reading longer books. Uh, we can try and quantify how much people should read by looking at reading speed. How much time do they have to read each week? Um, how many weeks are there in the semester or the term? And this will give us a rough number of words. And um, another way of looking at it is what the effect of reading is. Um, and something like 100,000 words has been shown to be necessary for students to stop the translation habit. So in order to start reading um, in their own language, they, um, they need to read around 100,000 words. This seems like a lot, um, which, of course, is a good thing because we're talking about extensive reading. But when you work out over a 15 week term where they're reading, if they can read 10 minutes a day for 15 weeks, this becomes a, not such a big number. Um, another way you can look at the, the amount they need to read is how much they need to read for vocabulary acquisition. So in order to acquire words, they need to see them repetitively. And again, you can come to um, a number of books per week or words per week. Um, the problems with counting, um, often minimums become maximums. So if you tell your students they need to read 100,000 words, they'll read up to 100,000 words and perhaps not beyond 100,000 words. Um, another um, another thing that you may have is this is a, this is a probably a typical class. So we have our um, light readers over here and our super readers over here. If we were to take 100 percent as the uh, top reader and look at this in a linear way, then most of the class have read less than 60 percent. So if your pass mark is 60 percent and you're using number of words with the top reader at 100%, most of your students fail. Um, Greg Dunn before talked about the, the broccoli effect, where if you have to read, uh, it's like you want your kids to eat broccoli, and um, you've got 15 sticks of broccoli to eat in 15 weeks. Some of the students will just gobble down all the broccoli as quickly as they can, and then never touch the broccoli again. Some of the students will eat no broccoli for 14 weeks. And then at the last minute, they'll start eating, shoveling broccoli down. And what you want is a kind of even like one stick of broccoli a week. Um, so, again, this is another 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 tricky part of measuring word count or how much they're reading. Um, I would suggest start with book counting. Um, use regular targets every week, every two weeks or every month and try to get non-linear rewards. So people who read twice as much should not get twice the score. Or if they read 10 times as much, they shouldn't get 10 times the score. Um, and if, if you can make targets fuzzy, um, that helps. Um, accountability. So how do you know they've read the book? This is a tricky question. There are many ways. There's a very long answer. How do you know they've read the book? There's a very short answer, which is you don't. You really don't know whether your students have read the book. 
uh, often students will spend more time getting around assessments than getting through them. They will try to find ways of convincing you by passing a test. It would have been easier to read the book and pass the test, but they will find other ways. If they have to write a book report, um, they can translate the book into their own language. Their friends could write it. They could copy something and paste it. So there's really um, no way, often with a res if you want your students to write a response to a book, this is going to be a lot of work for your students and work that they could have been spending reading. And it may not be enough to tell you whether they've read the book or not. Um, quizzes are maybe better. And there are some good quizzes, which we will hear about M Reader, we'll hear about X Reading. Um, did they take the test or did their friend take the test? Uh, does the test tell us whether they read the book? Um, and this is an issue that we'll hear more about later. Uh, you may not want your students to take tests for books of movies, something they could have read in their own language, uh, multiple path stories, books they've read before, comics. Um, but these are exactly the kind of books you may want your students to read. Um, so the fundamental problem we have, I think, when we come to assessment is if the reading really is extensive, we cannot reliably assess it. So if they are reading a lot, there's no way that we can check that they're doing all that reading. And if we are reliably assessing, then the reading probably is not extensive. So there's, it's almost that um, these are mutually exclusive. Assessment and reading don't really go together. Um, tests do have advantages. We'll hear more about tests later. Um, and uh, book records have advantages. A book record is simply the students making a note of what they have read. Um, you should be suspicious if your students are reading books that are not in your library. Um, you should be suspicious if they maybe they read four Harry Potter books in one week in the wrong order. Um, so there are there are ways and means there are things that we can do. Um, Summative and formative assessment also is very useful to think about. So some kinds of assessment look at what they are doing on a day-to-day -day basis. That's the process, that's formative assessment. Some of them, some of the assessments look at where they get to at the end. Um, that's, uh, that's summative assessment. Um, so uh, just to finish, um, I tried to come up with some rules for making assessments. The first one is, I think the most important thing, if we're talking about extensive reading, we need somehow to assess how much they read, or at least try to assess how much they read, or appear to assess how much they read. Um, assessments should make them read more. So every assessment we're doing, um, if we get them to write a book review, will that make them read more? Um, if it's the first book they've read ever, it may not do. Um, will a book review make someone else want to read more? If they write something about a book and someone in the class reads it and they want to read a book, that may be helpful. Um, do you write a book review every book that you read? Well, I certainly don't. Um, next thing then is uh, keep it simple. Um, everything should be as simple as possible, but no simpler. Uh, maybe this is not so important. Uh, keep it complicated. Um, it is complicated. That's maybe also not a very good rule. Uh, the next rule I came up with is to assess widely. So try to think about reliability and construct validity. Usually an assessment is not both. Um, try to have both summative assessment and formative assessment. Look at knowledge, skills, practice, and attitudes and look at rationale, methodology, books, and libraries. Um, I'll leave you with those rules, and I think I am going into a breakout room if anyone has any questions, and I will hand over for the next presenter. Thank you, Thank you Mark. Thank you, Wendy.
So we have another presentation beginning shortly. If you would like to ask Mark questions or discuss his topic with him, go ahead and join him in his breakout room. Uh, Wendy, please stop the live stream, if possible. Wendy's still there. Wendy's gone. Wendy's gone.